Hello, friends, and welcome into the Marriage Talk podcast. It's great to have you with us as we continue this journey of happily ever aftering together. Bill Hobson here, joined as always by Jay and Laura LaFoon. You can find out all sorts of information about their ministry, their marriage ministry at jayandlaura.com. And we've got that link in the podcast notes. And uh, Jay and Laura, we, we come into this conversation with a unique title, I want to make sure I emphasize the the words correctly. This is <laughs> this is a two part series. This is part one of fighting for us. It's very important we don't substitute the word with in the, <laughs> of that. Right? We want this to be right. fighting for us. So, what do you mean by fighting for? Well, us? here's kind of the origin of that. Um, we're from Michigan. We're big fans of Go Blue U of University of Michigan, and uh, this year when they won the national championship. They had uh, T-shirts that said us against everybody. Yes. Because it seemed like everybody hated us, didn't want us to win. I may um, have one of those T-shirts. Michigan so, yes. versus everybody, yes. Yes, uh, Michigan versus everybody. And we we were kind of going along that theme. And then the Lions took it over. And the Lions had the same thing, yeah. Detroit versus everybody. And so we thought, well, it's us versus everybody. But that that doesn't sound, that sounds very aggressive. Whereas fighting for us, we're fighting for our marriage. We're fighting all of the things that wants to, want to tear our marriage apart. All of the things that that say it's not worth it. We're fighting against all it's of about those. About being, using the sports analogy, being a team against all of that out there that wants to destroy our marriage. Yes. So, well, if you had to put together a list of adversaries of what is trying to tear down our marriages, what would that list look like? Children. <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's the there's the whole secular side yeah. that we can easily talk about, but there's also stuff that we would consider sacred that can tear apart our marriage. I mean, the secular side is stuff like pornography, uh, an affair, coworkers, uh, friends that are chatting in your ear about how terrible your spouse is. But then there's that stuff that is a part of who you are and a part of your marriage, so to speak, like. Children, schedules, jobs, extended family, extended family, um, money, I, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the pursuit of success, the pursuit of possession. And I'm going to dare say it: the church, yeah, Often, volunteer opportunity, volunteering too much at the church. As good as that is, as needed as that is, as much as that's important, if it's taking away from your marriage. If it's making your marriage diminish because you're doing all this stuff at church. Diminish in priority. Right. That's really what we're not saying. You obviously you can't have children or you can't have a job or you can't, you know, we're not, you can't be a volunteer. What we're saying though, is that when those things begin to take priority over this relationship, that's when you got to start fighting for us. Yeah. Scripture cool. talks about the, the myriad of things that are trying to pull us apart. Uh, particularly in Song of Solomon, there's a, a specific verse that says the flood of adversaries that come against us and it really i mean at times it feels that way it, i mean mm. when you're sitting here in your in your marriage and you love your spouse but it's just like wham 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 <laughs> wham wham you know you feel like a, a punching bag because of life and uh, that's kind of where we're where we're at with this okay so just just so we don't go viral for the wrong reasons let's, <laughs> let's restate the fact that the marriage talk podcast is not advocating you get rid of all your children right, right. <laughs> <laughs> just the ordinary ones <laughs> oh, yeah just the ones that you're really irritated with that particular day that's why you have grandparents in the equation <laughs> and over there. Uh, so this two-part series under the umbrella of fighting for us has two chapters to it and the first one is what are we supposed to be the second one is what are we supposed to do so let's start with what are we supposed to be and I, i'm assuming that you mean that from within one spouse to another correct we're actually, what we're supposed to be, and we'll just go ahead and break it down and then we'll get into those a little bit deeper, is that you're supposed to be a fan of your spouse. You're supposed to be a friend of your spouse and you're supposed to be a flirt um, with your spouse. And let's just be clear, clarify that too. Another so we one, we don't want to go for all the wrong reasons. All reasons. <laughs> yeah, so we'll start with, uh, you need to be a fan of your spouse. Um, and I think about the passage of scripture uh, in Philippians that talks about, you know, dwell on these things. Um, so often in our marriage, we dwell on the things that are negative, wrong in our spouse, negative, unlovely, all of those. You know, we tend to see those things first. And if we could just um, see the good in our spouse first, I often encourage women 
when they ask this question, how do I, you know, I just don't feel like my husband does anything that I can really look at that's good. And I encourage them that, you know, the first thing when they wake up in the morning and their feet hit the floor, just what is one thing I can focus on today that my spouse does that is he gets up and he goes to work. Um, he comes home and he pulls the car in the garage or <laughs> he doesn't leave it, you know, find something. And sometimes they're tiny, but if you focus on that good, then you begin to see more good. This is one of our soapboxes and, and we'll beat this drum and you may have heard us say it before. We're going to say it again. We can't say it enough. And that is residing inside your spouse is both royalty and foolishness. Okay. Royalty and foolishness. And to whichever one you speak is the one that will emerge. Mm -hmm. So if you speak to your spouse like they're royalty, like they're a son or a daughter of the king, which they are, that's the that's the spouse that will emerge. If you speak to your spouse like they're a foolish person and they do foolish things, which they will, then that's the person who will emerge. I'll give you a perfect example in our life. Um, uh, I used to be a really good golfer and I'm just an okay <laughs> golfer now. Uh, my wife used to be just an okay golfer and now she's a really good golfer. And um, there was a transition period there where I, it, it graded on me like crazy if she would have a score even close to mine, let alone beating mine. And then I determined that what I was going to do was I was going to tell her every time she made a good shot, every time she ground out that five foot putt for par, every time she made an amazing chip over a bunker and, and landed it close, I was going to tell her. And what's emerged is an even better golfer that now beats me almost every time we play. <laughs> but the bottom line is this, and that's the thing. Tell your, tell your spouse what they're doing great, and they'll do it even better. Tell their spouse what they're doing good, and they'll do it great. Or appreciate them. You know, not necessarily you're doing this really good, or I really appreciate it when you help me with the dishes, or I really appreciate the fact that you pack our kids lunches every day and we don't have to spend that money on school, you know, whatever it is. But when you speak those positive traits, those positive habits, those positive activities that you see in your spouse, then your spouse is going to kind of, you know, okay, I can do this. And, and so that's, that's that focusing, that dwelling on these things and you become your spouse. We say to each other all the time, especially when we're not feeling like each other's our biggest fan to remind each other, you know, I am your biggest fan. Yeah. I really am. Sure. I know right now it may not sound like it, but I really am your biggest fan and really becoming your spouse's biggest fan. Right. And then don't become depressed because this is your biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I even think about it in that, you know, again, we, we, we're, we love sports and I think about, you know, what kind of coach do you want to play for? Mm -hmm. Do you want to play for that coach that says great tackle, great block, great catch, or you miss this, you miss that. No, I don't want to play for that coach. I want to play for the coach that's telling me the things I'm doing well and then corrects me, but doesn't start with the negative um, because well, we all have things we've got to work on. I also don't want Ellen to make me run laps. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to really, say. That'd be really no, tough. Make you run laps. <laughs> but, but to take the take fan analogy uh, a little bit further, I also know that in the sports world, the teams that, that I'm passionate about, my Wolverines, my Lions, whatever, I am very ready, very happy to brag about them to, to other people who aren't fans of them, yep. right? who just the outside world. I mean, nothing I love more than running into a Buckeye fan these days and just <laughs> them how things are going down there in Columbus since they're in panic mode. Um, and I, I, I want to make sure that I'm bragging about my wife to other people. Yep. Not that they don't like her. Maybe they don't know her. I had breakfast this morning with a gentleman who just doesn't really know her. He's like, tell, tell me a little bit about your family. So I started telling him. And, and over the last week, my wife has been by the bedside of a family member that's having a really difficult time. And uh, she flew to another city to do all that and, and work the night shift there. I mean, it, it was really, really amazing. And I found myself bragging on her um, out of just, uh, yeah, a little bit of pride. I didn't have anything to do with her heart for this situation because I'm not that nice of a person or generous of a person. She's definitely the nicer one of the two of us. But as a fan, um, I it kind of felt pretty cool to realize that I'm part of that that team or that effort uh, way more than I am connected to my favorite sports teams. Right? I mean, yeah, I have my wife doesn't sell merchandise yet, thankfully. 
so I, you know, I don't have her logo on my chest, <laughs> but I can, I can still brag on what she does as a fan. So, well, and, and what's amazing when that, when that happens is you, you can take a sense of, of justified pride in, I made a good choice. Oh well, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I made a good choice and God has blessed me with this person. And again, going back to what Laura has said, you know, if you're looking for that, you're going to find it. If you're looking for the things that they're doing wrong, you're going to find that too. So look for the good because that, that's in everybody. Okay, so uh, we're supposed to be a fan and next we're supposed to be a friend, right? A friend, that is correct. And, you know, for most of us, at least I'll speak for the women. When we think of who are my friends, I'm going to make a, I have no scientific facts for this, but just talking to women, you ask them who are their friends, most of them are going to, Talk about their girlfriends. List off a litany of girlfriends, you know, oh, blah, 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 blah. And they probably may not even list their spouse. And I think making that a priority, I know for us. And if you ask guys who's our friend, friend yeah. they're going to say my dog, you know, because <laughs> <I mean, that's laughs> you know, he's faithful. Um, I think realizing that a friend is someone that you enjoy spending time with, um, that you enjoy being with, that you enjoy doing things with. And if your spouse is not one of those people, then we got to work on making sure that they are, that they are, because that, that will level up that priority of your relationship and your life. When you enjoy being together, when there's things that you enjoy doing together, when you just enjoy, I know we were sitting on the front porch one night and we were both, we, we're in Michigan in the spring and summer. We are outside as soon as it gets 55 degrees. <laughs> and we were sitting on the front porch because there was less wind than the patio. And we both had our iPads. We were reading books and it was just quiet. We were playing music. And I just kind of had this moment of, you know, I really enjoy being with him. I really enjoy just hanging out together. Who it wasn't like... <laughs> We weren't doing anything. I enjoy beating him at golf. Yes. But just that hanging out companion, sitting on the front porch, enjoying peace and quiet. And we need to get to that place in our marriages where we just enjoy each other's company. So uh, another analogy, it's not sports this time. It's, it's here in Michigan. We live in a very rural part of Michigan. And one of the words I love when it comes to relationships is that you have to cultivate your relationship. You have to cultivate that relationship. And to the, to the farm community, we all know exactly what that means. That means you take your, your tractor out there and you've got the little uh, dish dishes that are turning the, the dirt over and turning it over and turning it over. Why? So that seeds are planted more easily. Laura and I have a little hobby garden in our backyard. It's raised boxes. But uh, this year for uh, Christmas... I got an electric handheld cult, little cultivator. So we, <laughs> you know, but what it does is it turns the dirt over so that what seeds are planted easier. And when you cultivate your friendship, when you're turning it over and making sure that everything's, you know, nicely done, the seeds of, of love and joy and peace and patience are more easily planted in that friendship relationship. Yeah. So the, the key is finding things that you enjoy doing together and, you know, it's we're not saying that you have to spend every waking moment with your spouse, um, although we kind of do that <laughs> um, just based on our life and ministry together. But that, that's not what we're saying. We're just saying find those activities and hobbies that you and your spouse enjoy. Obviously, we enjoy playing golf together. Um, we enjoy cooking together. We enjoy cooking together. We, I, we went to a funeral. Okay. Cause so, so you might be saying, well, I don't like to golf. We don't like to cook. Find something. I'll give you two examples. We went to a funeral recently and there were flowers <laughs> from five different restaurants saying, thank you for being one of our best customers. Wow. So what he and his wife liked to do was to go out to eat. And now they weren't extravagant restaurants. It was Bob Evans for crying out loud. You know, it was just a, a, a nice place to go grab a bite to eat. But that's what they liked to do together was we like to go out to eat. We were in Florida and um, we had our little table with our umbrella and the out by the pool, out by the pool, the table next to us. This couple would come with a shopping bag full of board games and they would sit there all day long and play board games together. 
Now, that's not our cup of tea, but by golly, they loved it. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Find something that you like to do together. I'm thinking of uh, the route that some people take to find the Marriage Talk podcast. And, and quite often, that route begins with things are not going all that well. And I got to find some form of encouragement, some form of help. And they start to hear us talk about this concept of my spouse being my friend. And all they've known for quite some time is the adversarial side of that. It is the sniping, the snide comments. Maybe it's the yelling, perhaps profanity, name calling, uh, constant tension. The, all of the above. <laughs> you always, you never, uh, why can't you be more like, and that kind of thing, which continues to kind of build up that barrier between the two of them. For somebody who's listening right now, and really, they're nowhere near this idea of fan or friend stage right now. And I know next week, we're going to talk about some of these concepts. But what advice would you give them right now just to start taking baby steps in the right direction? You you just named it. And that's baby steps. Mm -hmm. um, give you this example. If you're estranged from a family member, and they've said, I don't want you in my life at all. I don't, don't, don't contact me. Don't email me. Don't phone call. That first email that that person sends is a baby step. It's not much, but it's a, it's a, it's a thread to hold on to. It's a promise from the Lord that, that things are going to change. And that's what, I mean, and we've had to have baby steps in our marriage a lot. Um, there's, there's no two ways about it. It's, it's, there have been not fighting for us, but fighting with us moments in our marriage uh, quite frequently over 40 years of marriage. And uh, I would say some practical baby steps. And again, whatever kind of situation you're in, maybe it's just after you've eaten dinner with your children or whatever, you know, sit at the table five more minutes longer and just say, so, so how was your day? Just, you know, and your husband or your wife, whoever might be shocked and fall on the floor. And, you know, but just that maybe just start with a question. So how was your day? You know, what was good? Or maybe it's, uh, you know, it's this time of year and it's sunny and warm outside. Hey, you, do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to sit on the pet? You know, just make any effort. And I don't know what that, I, I don't know what that would be based on each individual person but you know so let's just go for get some let's go get some ice cream you know and and it may be that you do take the kids hey let's go as a family and get some ice cream um but i know for a wife when a husband initiates something to do with the family together that speaks volumes and so your first baby step might be something that includes the kids um but again those activities and hobbies and again, it doesn't have to be rocket science. Like I said, a walk, go get ice cream, just a conversation that's not screaming and yelling and sniping at each other. Um, those those would be baby steps. Years ago, we wrote a book called He Said, She Said, and we interviewed over a thousand couples on words that are important to you as a male and a female. And um, just randomly, at the end of our survey, we put in this question. If you could change one thing about the opposite sex, what would it be? 96% of the ladies wish their husbands would be more aware. He's just not aware of what's going on. 97% of the men said, I wish she wouldn't complain. And I'm like, okay, I, I can totally see that. So we're finishing up the book. We're out for dinner with some friends up in Traverse City. And one of our friends is an orthopedic surgeon and very matter of fact, very direct. And I said, so, so what do you think the issue is? And he said, I don't care. And I thought he was talking to me about the situation. <laughs> I don't care what you're saying, Jay. No, and it wasn't. He's like, no, no. The problem is. I don't, we don't, I don't care. Right. We don't care about what's important to our spouse. Mm -hmm. And so that's why he said, we've got, we've got to get it within ourselves to care about what our spouse cares about. That's the hardest thing to do. I wish she wouldn't complain. She wishes I was more aware. Okay, we'll work on that. But let's care about the fact that that's a big deal to her. And I'm going to try and be more aware. 
And so he wasn't saying, I don't care about your book. He would say, I have to care about my wife. And I think that's a really good baby step hmm. is to say, okay, I'm going, I'm going to intentionally care about what you care about. And that's very hard because we are so very different. Yeah, for sure. And, and by the way, just kind of a little teaser, make sure you listen to the next episode because we will walk even more deeply through some of those rebuilding concepts. Uh, meanwhile, under the heading of what are we supposed to be, we've talked about you're supposed to be a fan and a friend. Uh, the last one will have some intrigue to it. You're supposed to also be a flirt. I'll let you two figure out what that is. <laughs> Well, it's it's different thing things at different uh, <laughs> stages of your marriage. Um, basically, uh, I can sum it up with this: um, we were doing a date night in rural Ohio, but the place was packed. There had to be four or five hundred people at this uh, uh, cafeteria gymnasium combination uh, auditorium. You know, uh, it was the all-purpose room, and for some reason, we're on stage, and I'm seeing this this can light that's sitting right over this elderly couple. I mean, it was just like they were in a spotlight <laughs> in the audience and they were probably in their eighties and they were holding hands and they were kissing and they were hugging each other. And they kind of strutted up to us at the end of the show at the book table. And he said, Jay, I want to tell you one thing to help these young people never forget. I'm like, great. This has got to be gold right here because it's this guy, clearly they're still in love. He said, remember, what you did to get your spouse is what you need to do to keep your spouse. Hmm. And what did we do early on? Now, men don't flirt well, but we did our best to flirt. You know, it's like, hey, hi, I'm here. Uh, there's my flirting. But, uh, you know, those those little things that aren't necessarily sexual, but are sensual, that are are attractive things that you know putting on some nice cologne um shaving before you go on a date it can be as easy as you know sending your spouse a text during the day that just says hey i was thinking about you i want you to know i love you that you know that's huge that's flirting and you know there's also in this day and age you can find all kind of flirty memes you know that you could send them if you didn't want to just say hey i love you you can send them a little flirty meme or whatever during the day um but like jay said you know putting on some nice cologne or, you know, sitting next to each other at night, watching TV and holding hands. That's flirting. Um, when you're, when you're flirting, when you're in the kitchen or, uh, you know, whatever works for you. My favorite place to flirt, believe it or not, is church. Oh, because really? It is because as we're sitting there listening to the sermon, I love to put my arm around her back. I love to hold her hand. I love to put my hand on her knee and she knows, and, and this is honest to goodness. She knows that this is just flirting that this, I mean we're in church this is not gonna go anywhere one, one would hope not yes yeah <laughs> but you know I mean it's just that simple way of saying honey I I want to I want to hug you I want to hold your hand I want to you know I want to caress your knee and I only I want to do it because I love you not because I'm expecting something later and um again I know I'm just demented that way church yeah flirt in church Look at look at her across the lobby and give her a wink when she's having you know a sip of coffee with her girlfriends and you're having a sip of coffee. Open with the yours. door for your wife, whether it's to go into the house or get into the car. That is a that is a flirt. It you know we we think flirting is sexual, but it's really what you what you communicating when you flirt is that you're important to me. And so whatever it might be that it communicates to your spouse that you are important to them. Mm -hmm. um, speaking love languages, I believe we've already gone, we've, we've done this in the Marriage Talk podcast. So go back and listen to, uh, to Dr. Chapman and, and Jay and I and Bill talk about the love languages. But speaking your spouse's love language, what is it? It's flirting. Um, it's flirting. And it's important that we keep that in our relationship. And it builds, if you if you kind of pay attention to what we've done today, you have to become a fan of your spouse, then become a friend, and then the flirt. So you really need to kind of work on all of these three in order, but also at the same time. And, and the reality is this, uh, flirting does not have to be sexual, but in, in a way it is because what you are saying to your spouse is you're still attractive to me. Yeah, I still feel an attraction to you. Um, you know, we're not going to go anywhere on this show that's that's over the line. But the bottom line is sex is a part of marriage. 
And that is a great way to say, um, you know, the kids are little, it's not happening as much as we'd like, but you're still important to me in a, in a very uh, sexual way. And again, different seasons bring different challenges, but uh, you can always, you can always flirt. You know, the setting isn't always a place like Grand Hotel where you have your Celebrate Your Marriage Conference every year, probably among the, you know, five or 10 most romantic places on earth. Sometimes the setting is the house where you're living every single day and you wish you could get away, but perhaps a a creative approach to being there and uh, doing something a little bit, I don't know, extra or special, or maybe something you just haven't done for a very long time, like uh, I, I cleaned up my stuff, <laughs> you know, a gesture a something and, nope. you know, exactly. and, I did it, and I did it for you, you know, yep. things. So, okay. So under the, uh, auspices of what are we supposed to be a fan friend flirt in the umbrella category for this week and next is fighting for us. And we'll pick up the conversation next week with what are we supposed to do after we've now learned what are we supposed to be. So please check that out. Uh, make sure you share the link with others in your world. And don't forget to go to uh, jnlaura.com where you can find out more information about all the things they are up to and the opportunity for your church or your community group to, uh, to bring them in for some coaching and a special get together that really focuses and brings a, a fire hose of attention onto all things marriage, and uh, they promise not to go viral for any of the wrong reasons. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you all again next week on Marriage Talk.